thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Gratton Smith. I'm a pediatrician from Greenwood. I uh, was in practice there for the last 25 years, and I've been a long-standing member of the Child Fatality Advisory Committee in, here in South Carolina. I tend to be kind of soft-spoken, so if at any point uh, I'm not loud enough, please raise your hand and let me know that. Uh, I want to make sure everybody can hear. I was asked today to kind of go over an overview of the Child Fatality Advisory Committee, what it is, what we do, and go over some of our findings. Um, the other members that are here today uh, actually attend all the Child Fatality Advisory Committee meetings. Uh, Jennifer Buster here is with the Department of Disabilities and Special Needs. Uh, she's been a long-term member of the committee. Laura Hudson's on the end. She too has been a long-time uh, member. She is a, uh, recognized as a child advocate on our committee and she's very active in advocacy for children and, and victims in South Carolina. And Captain Patsy Lytle with SLED is not actually a member of the committee, but she is the uh, person at SLED who is the child fatality person and also victim, other victims, uh, special victims unit. Um, so we've all worked together on this child fatality advisory committee for years. Um, and hopefully we can share some information with you today. Um, first of all, you know, you might ask, well, why does uh, child death review matter? Well, we feel strongly that it does matter because it helps us identify patterns or trends in child fatalities in South Carolina that may help us come up with solutions and uh, ways to decrease the incidence of child death in South Carolina. It also lets us compare ourselves to other states in the country so we'll know how we stand in uh, different areas of child fatality. Um, we see a big task of ours as making sure deaths are accurately classified because if we don't have deaths classified accurately, we really can't make meaningful statistics of them and we can't compare ourselves to other states if we're not uh, comparing apples to apples. Uh, all of this hopefully will help us uh, allow to make more meaningful suggestions for a change that may, will overall decrease deaths in South Carolina in children. And the current system we have now of having a multidisciplinary team is recognized by the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta as being the best approach to uh, analyze child deaths and make changes in the state. Uh, the committee actually is, uh, was mandated by legislation um, back in 1993 and the legislation actually defined wh what kind of members were supposed to be on the Child Fatality Advisory Committee. Uh, it said that we would make an annual report, which we do. Uh, one of the things it didn't provide for, though, was any funding, which has been a bit of a challenge for the committee. Um, so the different state agencies involved have had to kind of pitch in and, and give man hours and use of their computers and statistical analysis. And I really think the Child Fatality Advisory Committee is in the best position it's ever been in. We have very strong support from DHEC now that helps us with our compilation of statistics and calculations. Well, what the committee does is we actually meet um, on a monthly basis and meet for a full day every month and review cases that are, are defined by the original legislation as cases that, that should be reviewed. And those cases are any deaths of, of children less than 18 years old, any death that's unexpected, suspicious, unexplained, or occurs when a child is not under the direct care of a physician. That last statement means that if a, if a child has a terminal illness and is being cared for in a medical setting, for instance, a child has leukemia and uh, the death was not a surprise, was actually expected, that, we don't review that death because that child is under the direct care of a physician and did not meet this definition of being uh, suspicious, unexplained, or unexpected. But the law states that we review all cases of, of SIDS uh, and others that meet that definition. We do not review traffic 
or highway deaths because those are viewed by the Department of Motor Vehicles. So it's important to realize that that when we review uh, deaths that meet our definition, we're not reviewing every death, a child death that occurs in the state. And if you, I'm going to refer to 2009, that seems like a long time ago, but uh, for reasons that will become clear a little later, that is our latest, latest completed report, annual report, is, is 2009. That means we got to have all the deaths reviewed and have, have published our final report. Uh, but if you look in 2009, there were some 600 and something deaths of children less than 18. But of those, uh, a little less than 200 met the definition that the Child Fatality Advisory Committee would review. So all the statistics I'm going to go over today are talking about the ones that we have reviewed. They don't include the other almost 400 deaths that include motor vehicle accidents and include uh, uh, deaths such as children that died of diseases that were expected or it wouldn't, we don't review deaths of premature babies who were in the NICU for months and then died from their prematurity. So remember, our numbers are talking about reviewed deaths for us. Now the uh, initial legislation that formed our committee defined uh, which members should be on the committee and it is a very broad multidisciplinary committee includes representatives from DHEC and our representatives are here in the room today and we're, we're glad to see them and again they provide us with tremendous help in a uh, compilation of our reports and statistics. The Department of Disabilities and Special Needs, Department of Education, SLED. Uh, I have served as a pediatrician representing the South Carolina chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We have a forensic pathologist that's on the committee someone from the Criminal Justice Academy, uh, somebody from the Department of Social Services, and I'll have to say of all these members, they probably take the most heat, um, and I commend them for continuing to be a part of this committee, although they really don't have a choice, it's mandated by law, but, um, uh, you know, often uh, families are involved with the Department of Social Services, and when, if a child dies, it's involved with that family, there are a lot of questions about well, how did this death, how, how did it occur? Uh, we have a member from the Department of Youth Services, uh, somebody from the South Carolina Commission on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, uh, the South Carolina Coroner's Association is represented and that's a very important member of the committee because every death that occurs in our state has to be signed off by a current coroner that uh, assigns a cause of death and manner of death which is very important for our statistics. Uh, we have somebody from the Department of Mental Health and the committee calls for two child advocates. I mentioned Laura Hudson is one of our official child advocates and we have had others in the past. Right now I think there are three vacancies on the committee and to get those members, um, we have to contact the agency that's responsible for uh, supplying that member and get them to, to give us a name and, and so it's a process we have to go through and then the governor has to actually appoint that member. Um, I'll ask our members that are here today to please interrupt me at any point if they want to uh, add any information to our discussion and please if you have any questions feel free to ask as we go along. Just raise your hand. Uh, at our meetings we sometimes have guests uh, from different agencies in the state that may want to talk to us for a while. Um, the individual members uh, bring up any topics they have or any information they might have learned about uh, child deaths in general. Uh, and we have kind of a general session and then we go into an executive session where uh, members who really don't need to know the dirty details uh, are asked to leave and uh, then we review sometimes as many as 40 cases at our monthly meeting and usually in a year's time we review about 200 to 250 cases. Now the process for how uh, we obtain the file and review a case uh, is pretty involved. You know initially a child death has to occur. By South Carolina law the coroner uh, you know is notified and, and declares somebody dead and then the law states that they really should notify the Department of Child Fatalities that SLED within 24 hours. 
most of the time this happens, but occasionally one slips through and, and we may not get a report. That's one of the reasons we sometimes don't complete the annual report on as, as timely a basis as we would like, just because we may not even know about a case until after the fact. So, but when we do, uh, when the Department of Child Fatalities at SLED, and Patsy, you correct me if I need correcting on this, uh, finds out about a child death, an agent is assigned that case, and that SLED agent uh, gets all the details. They get the coroner's report, they get the law enforcement report, they get medical records, that alone could take quite a while. They get input from DSS and get any of their records. Uh, and again, all these uh, are confidential records and are protected by state and federal laws. Uh, so there's a legal process that has to be gone through for us to be able to get those. And all the members of the committee have signed statements that uh, this information is all confidential as far as being able to identify a particular case outside of our meeting, so we don't generally discuss details outside of the, the meeting. Uh, the agent also gets law enforcement notes, and once they've gotten all the information and the case is considered complete, they'll type up a report and uh, bring it to the committee. Now, we don't usually uh, review cases where legal action is pending. Uh, or say if an arrest is pending, it wouldn't really be appropriate for us to be discussing that case until law enforcement is, has done what they need to do and then consider the case completed. Um, that's exactly why it takes so long. And you know, the, the, the statistics I'm using today were from 2009 because that's our last completed report because there are still cases from 10, 11, 12 that aren't really done. And uh, the way DHEC has helped us lately is when we get uh, a certain percentage of cases from a year, they'll help us produce a provisional report or a preliminary report before we actually publish the final report. So if you go to DHEC's website right now and, and search for child fatalities, you'll have access to the last completed report, which at this moment is 2009, but there's also a provisional report for 2010, and I think 2011 will be very soon. So, um, so once this is completed, it comes to the committee and at the actual meetings, what, what we do is, you know, this case is presented and everybody in the room, those 13 to 15 members that are present, if their agency had anything to do with that child, we, they report on it. Uh, again, this is where DSS is often in, in the hot seat because they know a lot of these children. Um, and the pediatrician on the committee, which has been me up until very recently, has to review all the medical records, which sometimes might be a notebook this thick, uh, but we all report what we have gleaned about the case, and then we see if we have any recommendations uh, or suggest a change in classification of the death or we need more information. Um, and when we complete a case, we will We'll classify it under a certain category, and then we will list any comments we have about that case so that when we publish our report, we'll have all that information. Um, and our goal is to see how we can prevent child deaths by looking at systems issue. It's not to be um, punitive in any way or to place blame. It's really more of a proactive uh, committee. Now, what we do not do is, you know, our committee is not uh, supposed to solve crimes, and we don't attempt to do that. However, on occasion, we may have a case that's been, quote, completed, and then it really, something just looks like it's not right, uh, and, and we feel there may be, need to be more investigation, and we may have our SLED person give that back to law enforcement for clarification or to see if there's something else they need to do about that case. And that has resulted in significant actions sometimes when a, a case gets referred back and it turns out charges are made uh, for abuse or neglect or homicide even. If I can jump in here, I, I work for DDSN, so I have um, early interventionists that go out and go into homes. 
homes all across the state and serve children with special needs and their families. So one of the things, um, like Dr. Smith talked about, some of the, the ways that each member takes that information back. For example, I saw a lot of the situations and some of the ways in which some of these children were dying. And so what I did was talk to the early interventionists that are actually in the homes. And what many of them said to me was, oh, I see these things, but I don't really feel like I, sh I can bring it up. It's so uncomfortable. I don't really feel comfortable bringing up to the parent that you know I'm concerned about this, that, or the other. So at DDSN, I developed a safety checklist that early interventionists do one time a year with family members because they're in the home and they see these things. So they can address um, you know, where the, the crib might be positioned and um, you know, does the, the family have a gun and is it in a safe location and all these things. Do they have smoke detectors? Just general things that regard safety because they are in the home and you know, it's important because they're in there, they see many of these things that they can go ahead and try to address it with the family. So, you know, that's one way I took it back as an agency and I know that many of the other members do the same thing. You know, that we, we take, we don't take specific information obviously because it's protected, but we can use general trends and say this has been a problem. So, and I try to give ongoing updates to early intervention supervisors um, front loading dryers and washing machines has become a new thing so I try to throw that out when I meet with them and just say hey now this has come up or something so that's just an example of, of how we sort of share the information with the agencies from which we come so sorry thank you okay when we uh, are compiling our statistics we group cases now based on the year they occurred. Oh, excuse me. Another yeah, question? Just, just a quick question, a logistical question. If a child's death is reviewed at a local child death review committee, is that something that would be reviewed by the local child death review committee or would it have to be reviewed by the state? Yes, it is. Okay, so the state is required to review all the deaths even if they have or have not been reviewed locally? Yes, it is. Now, it would be great if we had more formal communication between local child death reviews and the state uh, review team because I really, and I've served on the local review team in Greenwood as well as the state, most of the time the local team can do their review faster than the state can and everybody in that room may actually know the, the family we're talking about and it really is a very effective way to review, I think maybe more effective um, and ideally, every county in the state would have a, a local team, but there are only a handful right now. Now, is there a mandate that says that, the, that is there anything that is mandating the local child death review? I don't think so. We attempted to do that several years ago, and I got beat up so badly at the General Assembly from both partners. So right now, the, the state team is the official child death review team, um, but it would be great if there were communication, formal communication from the local teams. and um, it, something made me think. One way that our committee ha sometimes gets back to a county or a hospital system is, for instance, we on the state committee have realized over the years that, that we see a good many babies whose mothers were known uh, substance abusers or substance dependent mothers 
And those babies really, I think, have a higher rate of death than babies who weren't. And so we've actually been able to, to make suggestions back to a particular community and say we really think DSS should be more heavily involved with these cases uh, because we're seeing these babies die. So that, that's one way we, we hope that we're making a difference on the state level by looking at the big picture. Um, now, in 2009, there were 189 deaths that were reviewed and, and are completed cases now, and that's out of about 600 total child deaths, so about a third of them. Now, just to review a little bit about South Carolina before I get into specifics of our findings in the 2009 review, you know, in South Carolina, there are about four and a half million people. If you look at the number of people in South Carolina less than 18 years old, which is the group whose deaths we would investigate, it's about 23% or just over a million children in our state, 1,035,000. If you look at the racial distribution in South Carolina, and the reason I'm bringing this up is I think it's going to be important when we look at the actual numbers of child deaths. In South Carolina, there are 62% of the population is considered white. 27.9% uh, are black. Um, that leaves a significant percentage that are other. We all are aware that we, over the last 10, 15 years, have had a significantly increased number of Hispanic patients in our, our excuse me, uh, residents in our state, which uh, is very significant and it's reflected in some of our statistics. 17% of the people in South Carolina are below the poverty level. This is the statistic that makes me sad is if you look at all the eighth graders, only 75% of those will make it to graduation. So that means between the eighth and eighth grade and graduation, we're losing 25% of our high school students to drop out. Um, Approximately 25% of babies in South Carolina are born to single mothers. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody in this room, I, I'm sure you've seen these statistics before, but we do have a work ahead of us. Now, if you look at 2009, the deaths by race, um, and these are raw numbers here. There were 81 deaths reviewed of white children and 84 black children. You know, just right away you see a, there's an incredible racial disparity in child deaths in South Carolina. We said the state was about uh, close to two-thirds white, one-third black, but look at our rate of death in black children. It's, it's more than half of the deaths we, we review. I think it's important to note any kind of racial disparities in any kind of analysis of statistics. Um, and if, this pie graph actually shows uh, there were 13 Hispanic children that we reviewed, five biracial, and I'm sure there are a lot more biracial that were classified probably as black, and I'm not, I don't know that that matters uh, really, but uh, some Asian and then some unknown. If you look at uh, cases reviewed by gender, um, I think uh, boys in general have a higher death rate than girls. Um, and if you look at the rate of death for a male in South Carolina who's black, their chances of dying before the age of 18 are significantly higher than, than, than other children, which to, to me says we've got a long way to go in helping to protect these children. Now, in any child that dies, or any person that dies, on the death certificate, there's a, a cause of death that usually the doctor or maybe the coroner fills in and then, then there's a manner of death. You know, there are a thousand causes of death. Now, that could be pneumonia, could be a gunshot wound, uh, could be anything that led to the death. It, it's not supposed to be cardiopulmonary arrest, which, you know, anybody that's dead has had a cardiopulmonary arrest. And DHEC does not like to see that listed and it's not an acceptable cause of death. So. On the death certificate, you know, there are five lines or so, and it says uh, immediate cause of death uh, con as a consequence of. So usually if, if, if somebody lists cardiopulmonary arrest, the coroner or somebody's going to send that back and say that's not good enough. Why did they have the cardiopulmonary arrest? So they have to give a more specific cause of death. Now, the manner of death, 
is only one of five choices, and the manner of death is, is either a considered a natural death, an accidental or unintentional injury death, homicide, suicide, or undetermined. And when we classify our statistics, those are very important uh, manners of death that we go back and, re and review. So that's pretty concrete, only five uh, manners of death. Now, if you look at manner of deaths in 2009 in, in children in South Carolina, notice that accidents accounted for the largest category, and that was over 35 percent accidents. And uh, I had never actually seen this handout before, but this was um, in our booklet that we got today. And if you look on uh, this front page of it, it says the number one cause of childhood injury and fatality of children in, in South Carolina is motor vehicle deaths. That's where a lot of these accidental deaths, excuse me, occur in South Carolina children. Natural deaths were the, the next biggest category. Uh, this is disturbing that homicide is the third leading manner of death of children in South Carolina. Undetermined was next, and then pending and, and suicide. Any questions about any of that? Now, if you look at, let's, let's talk about accidental deaths for a minute. If you look at the trend of accidental deaths of South Carolina children since 1993, you know, this graph is kind of all over the place, but if you calculate an average and plot it out, you can see that the accidental deaths are increasing, and this really goes along with this, the same actually slide that was presented on national data that Dr. Moon talked about at lunch. Accidental deaths have appeared to increase. Uh, I really do think that part of this is, is better classification of deaths because as we've seen SIDS deaths decrease, we've seen accidentals increase. And what that, part of what that means to me is that deaths that we used to call SIDS, which have unfortunately been classified as a natural death traditionally, they're now being reclassified as accidental because there were, there were risk factors for suffocation found in the analysis and the investigation. And remember the overall, nationally, the overall incidence of, of infant death or, or actually childhood deaths has not changed much in the last decade. So some of this is probably false um, and has more to do with reclassification. But if you break down the accidental uh, causes of death in 2009, and these again are raw numbers, not, not percentages, uh, look at asphyxia as the largest category. Dr. Moon gave a great uh, discussion about asphyxia, which is a very broad category uh, as, a, as a cause of death, which essentially means anything that blocked the airway and led to a, a, a child death. Now, you could technically say, well, drowning might be a form of asphyxia, but that's separated out as, a, as, a, as a another specific cause. Um, and I want to talk some about these individual cases, uh, I mean, individual uh, causes of death, because accidents are such a huge contributor to overall child death in South Carolina. And remember, our statistics that I'm showing you don't have anything to do with car wrecks, which are the number one accidental uh, death of children in our state. So we're talking about deaths other than motor vehicle accidents, unless they occur on private property. If a child gets run over in a driveway and dies, that comes into our statistics because that was not a highway death. That was on private property. Okay, now look at uh, the second category was drowning. We had 19 cases in 2009. Third was fire. So right here, our three big players in accidental deaths are uh, asphyxia, drowning, and fire. Next was shooting. Our fourth number, you know, fourth leading cause of accidental death of childhood in, in childhood in South Carolina is, is shooting, which I think is very significant. Um, overdose. We might think that's pretty rare, but it, it was our. Uh, fifth leading cause of accidental death. Vehicular, these were the vehicular deaths on private property that would include 
uh, automobile, pedestrian accident, or a child killed on a four-wheeler. That's considered a vehicular death in our analysis. And then poisoning. Any questions about those? No, no, that doesn't, that's not a, DMV doesn't review that death, that comes to us, and that would be in the, uh, the small category of other. You mean like a child that's left in the car and overheated? Yeah. Yeah, that would be in the other category. Okay, if you look at accidental deaths by age, again, the deaths we reviewed on our committee um, most of the fatal accidents occurred in children less than a year old. Uh, one to four was the next category. If you look at those two, you know, kids less than, than five accounted for, you know, m the majority of accidental deaths in childhood in South Carolina. The children who are most vulnerable and the, the most helpless are the children who are, become the victims of accidents. You know, if you look at uh, accidental deaths by gender, again, males are, you know, twice, almost twice the rate of females. Um, I'm sure it's related to testosterone. Uh, some people would say females are smarter, and that, that may be so, but um, <laughs> now, um, as far as backing up to the, the types of accidental deaths, and I talked some about asphyxia, which is very broad. It could be anything from like, uh, you know, suffocation it could be bed covers, cushions, plastic bag. We've reviewed deaths like that. Who would leave a plastic bag on a baby's crib? It's happened. Um, overlay means a baby that was in bed with another child or adult and somehow got under that person or under a body part of that person and suffocated. Entrapment wedging is usually when a baby gets between a mattress and a wall or between sofa cushions or, or between the back of the sofa and a cushion. Positional asphyxia is another term that's used and that means a baby that was placed on their abdomen and it just in the pictures Dr. Moon had in the corner of the crib between the blankets and pillows, that's a positional asphyxia. Um, choking is a form of asphyxia too, and that could be anything from a food to a foreign body to a person's own vomitus. So asphyxia is, is the number one accident category, but it's very broad. One thing we do, we also try to share information. If a child shows on a particular item, a particular toy or something like that, we usually try to follow back up with like the Consumer Product Safety Committee and you know let them know, okay, we've had a child show on a particular item sharing of, of information so that hopefully we can another down. Thank you. Um, that, that is a good point. And we always try to do that. If, if a child choked on some kind of product, we try to let the Consumer Product Safety Commission know about that. Now, switching on to drowning deaths, um, in 2009, um, you know, kids less than four were the number one age bracket that, that drowned uh, and it decreased with age. Uh, again, this is a very handy uh, summary page printed by Children's Trust. Um, and it goes through drownings and makes the point that 79% uh, of the deaths for children under 14 are, drowning deaths occurred at a private residence. The typical story is when we're reviewing a case, uh, somebody was supposed to be watching the children, they kind of lost sight of them for just a few minutes. Child makes its way out the sliding glass door to the deck or pool, falls in the pool, is not found until the child's actually lifeless in the pool and then is discovered. So pools at private homes are our number one location of drowning in South Carolina, but we have reviewed cases of children drowning in ditches full of water, ponds, even buckets of water, uh, bathtubs, and uh, over here in the teenage 
range, that's usually teenagers that were hanging out by a river or, or a pond. They decided to take a swim or swim across the waterway and one of them who's often not a good swimmer and maybe not even a swimmer at all and they wind up drowning. Uh, again, I think that's a reflection of teenage risk-taking behavior. Um, and in this, these categories, sometimes we review deaths of children who are at the beach and are not good swimmers and they get knocked down by a wave or caught in an undertow and actually wind up drying, drowning in the surf. Okay, drowning deaths, again, looking at gender, males are, you know, twice as likely to drown in male children in South Carolina than females. Um, most, most of our deaths are, are residents, but, but every year we review from Horry County, which is where Myrtle Beach is, we review, review deaths of uh, people that were on vacation and children either died at the hotel swimming pool or died in the ocean. So, and I'm sure that us being a coastal state, and I haven't compared us to other states, but we, you know, those are deaths that they wouldn't see in Oklahoma or another state. Now, uh, moving on to fires, uh, if you look at 2009 fire deaths by race, another racial, significant racial disparity, uh, seven out of 13 fire deaths were in black children, whereas if you remember the state, only a third of our state is, is black, so a, a disproportionate number of black children died in fires. Um, significant in 2009 that almost all the others were others and only one white death, uh, fire death in a child. Now, you know, this is only, uh, uh, only, this is too many fire deaths, but the small numbers of deaths, and it really could take only one house fire that had four children in it to really skew these statistics on, on a one-year basis. Okay, this is significant too. If you look at fire deaths in 2009 in children based on the kind of house they lived in, the vast majority were in mobile homes. Um, and the remainder were traditional houses, uh, frame houses that were built. And I don't think there's any question that a, a fire in a mobile home is, is horrendous. Uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, really that's so bad except I guess the shape of it may be conducive to a fire that gets out of control but um, there's no question we see more mobile home fire deaths in children than we do in regular homes. If you look at fire deaths by age again children less than five are the largest category of victims of course those are the children who are most helpless least likely to be able to find their way out of a burning structure Um, okay, as far as accidental gunshot wounds, and again, these are accidental gunshot wounds. Um, there were five children in 2009 that died of accidental gunshot wounds. Uh, only one in the less than, nine, less than 10 year old category, two in the 10 to 14, and two in the 15 to 17. Often in this age range, the Accidental gunshot wounds have to do with a hunting accident or a target shooting accident. Um, unfortunately, in the younger children, they often occur when a child finds a gun, picks it up, plays with it, and uh, it fires and kills themselves or another child. Uh, you know, South, guns are popular in South Carolina, and I think the majority of households in South Carolina have at least one gun in the home. Our committee has been in favor for years of getting legislation passed that says that if you own a gun and store it in a way that, that a child winds up getting hurt or killed because of the way you store the gun, you should be liable for charges. That too is a bill that's never been very popular. And I don't know that it ever, ever will be, but um, I don't think that's unreasonable. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying people shouldn't own guns, but if you own a gun, you should actually 
keep it stored in a place where a child can't get to it and hurt themselves. We've actually reviewed one case where uh, the owner of the gun had a concealed weapons permit. He would come home at night, lay his gun out on the table, and uh, he happened to do that, and a child found the gun and, and killed themselves. And to me, that's just, you know, if anybody should know about safe gun handling, it ought to be somebody with a concealed weapons permit. So. Uh, and this is probably too much information, but I, I've enjoyed being a shooter all my life and like to hunt, but I won't join the NRA because they are so negative about supporting any kind of gun safety legislation. They have some good gun safety programs, but you try to get a law passed, their lobby blocks it every time. So. In 2009, we had two, two kids who died in four-wheeler accidents. Um, which in my mind is, is too many. You know, we see every year now, we see some kids die in, you know, on four-wheelers. Um, and I really think it's, it's easier to die on a four-wheeler than it is to die on a motorcycle. And we don't, we don't see child deaths on motorcycles, I think because it takes a certain skill level to, to ride a motorcycle. But anybody can jump on a four-wheeler and take off without having the skill or balance. Um, Laura, do you want to mention anything about four-wheeler stores? Well, Senator Cutto from Martinburg, he tried to get some legislation through that was considerably under mind, but he did get that. Sorry, we can't hear you back here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You're kind of rowdy. <laughs> yeah. uh, Senator Hutto from Orangeburg. Um, for about four years in a row tried to get some ATV uh, legislation through. He was successful, but it was considerably weakened by the, the, the other members of the Senate and House. I know that he is uh, still interested in toughening that up, and the, the issue was on, you know, private property. Do we have a right to, to tell people on, on private property what they can do with, with uh, their vehicles and whether or not they need to have helmets and what age group and so that is an un ongoing uh, issue, and it's an ongoing support from our committee. Thank you. And you can actually get a copy uh, out at one of, the, uh, one of the tables about Chandler's Law that, that talks about what's illegal for children on an ATV in South Carolina at this time. And it is, uh, it's a definite step forward, but it's pretty weak. It says minimum age to operate an ATV is six years old. Um, which I have a real problem with. But. Now, we're going to move on to the cate category of deaths, uh, SID, sudden infant death syndromes, uh, sudden unexplained infant deaths, sudden unexplained uh, death in infancy. Uh, I think that's better. Okay, it, if you, this slide is to point out which Dr. Moon did on a national level. In South Carolina, since 1992, when the Back to Sleep campaign was first promoted by the American Academy of Pediatrics, we've seen SIDS deaths pretty much plummet, and they're kind of leveling off uh, from here on. Uh, I have no doubt that, that a significant number of these deaths were because we placed child, children on their backs, but because we have become so aware of the risk for uh, sleep-associated deaths in children, and coroners have to, a child that dies in a crib who was on their stomach, who, who had blankets and pillows and other stuff in the bed, is much less likely to be classified as a SIDS than it, than it was back in the, in the 90s, and more likely to be classified as either an undetermined or an accident. And again, most, most of these are classified as natural, uh, which does throw a kink in our, our statistics. Any questions about that? Okay, if you look at homicide deaths in 2000, uh, 93, I mean, 1993 up through 2009, uh, unfortunately, we have shown a steady, gradual increase. Not huge numbers, but that line's going in the wrong direction. 
If you look at homicide deaths by age in 2009, uh, we kind of see two categories, younger children and then teenagers. Most of these younger children homicide deaths were definitely the result of uh, child abuse. Uh, once in a while, uh, we'll see a child who um, is involved in a domestic altercation and somebody takes a shot at mom and accidentally kills, well, they kill the baby. It's determined a homicide, not an accident, but they often or sometimes are not the intended target, but still it's a, it's a homicidal death. Unfortunately, out here in the older kids, most of these are teenagers, sometimes drive-by shootings. Uh, often gangs and drugs are involved. You know, practically all of these uh, we think are, are involved in gangs or drugs. Now, if, if we look at uh, child deaths uh, where the, the cause of death was homicide and by child abuse, fatal child abuse, and we can actually analyze who were the perpetrators. In 2009, out of 17 cases, uh, the two biggest categories were mom's boyfriend and then fathers. So far and away, it was the, a male figure that was involved in the care of the child that was the perpetrator. Um, we had three that were considered strangers, meaning they weren't a relative or a uh, somebody with known long-term connections. Uh, two were uncles. One out of 17 was an actual mother. One was a stepmom, one sibling, and then one other. And I was a little surprised, and I, uh, it would be interesting to see what this does over many years. I usually think about mom's boyfriend as being the number one perpetrator in fatal child abuse cases, but it's alarming that the actual fathers were perpetrators in just as many in 2009. Now, if you look at uh, how children that died of fatal child abuse were killed in 2009, um, Abusive head trauma is the new term for what used to be called shaken baby syndrome. And that's probably a more appropriate term because the, the findings that you see in shaken baby syndrome uh, can be caused sometimes by other abusive trauma to the head that's not actually shaking the baby. It could be some impact. And so uh, that's the way it's categorized now. There were two asphyxia deaths by child abuse. Uh, eight actual beatings, um, one blunt head trauma, which is distinguished from abusive head trauma, which is, is, is not a specific single blow to the head, whereas this would be actual evidence of blows to the head. And unfortunately, one baby that was, that was determined to actually have starved to death in the care of its family. Now, uh, with DHEX help, we're able to every year look at uh, you know the death rate for children in individual counties in South Carolina. And traditionally, our numbers have been just reported as raw numbers of deaths, and we're in the process now of converting everything to rates, which will make it much more meaningful. But what I did in 2009 is looked at uh, counties that had deaths uh, over five deaths of children in their county and kind of compared the counties and then calculated the rate. And if the rate's what's important, and that's the number of deaths per 100,000. And if you look at these, the counties with the highest rate of child death in our state are Spartanburg, was up here at 35, which is kind of surprising. I usually think of Charleston, North Charleston as being a pretty dangerous place to live. Theirs was only 22. And I don't mean any offense by that, but we tend to see a lot of drug and gang teenage deaths in Charleston. Um, what surprised me was Darlington has a, the highest uh, child death rate in the state in 2009. And if you go back and look at that, there were, there were just six deaths and they were really spread out in multiple categories in a way that to me didn't suggest any significant pattern. I think it was just a bad year for Darlington. If you look at Lexington, they had 35, and part of 
uh, this was when you, if you go back and look at, at uh, how those children died, they had six ch children that died in fires that year, and that's definitely enough to skew this death rate. And you know that may may have been just one or two fires that that changed all that. But I think this is helpful for us to be able to sit down and look at different counties and and say, well, what's going on in Spartanburg? Why, why is your death rate so high compared to everybody else's? Now, uh, we do review all suicides in children. Unfortunately, uh, kids do commit suicide. Um, most of the time, it's teenagers. Um, if you look at the breakdown in, in gender, in 2009, there were just as many females that committed suicide as males. Most years, I think there are more males than females because they're more likely to actually carry out a suicide than males are. If you look at the age range, uh, in 2009, there were two kids less than 15 that, that committed suicide. There were six in the 15 to 17. Uh, two of those deaths revolted, resulted from self-inflicted gunshot wounds and six were from hangings. Now, overall, uh, trends that we have noted that we would like to bring to everyone's attention are that uh, there are an alarming number of deaths still on, on children involving four-wheelers. Uh, child deaths and fires are much more common in mobile homes. In fire deaths, often we cannot find documentation of a working smoke alarm in the home. Uh, and there is a place when fire deaths are reported uh, for specifically for smoke detector, uh, functional, non-functional. And most of the time, we can't find documentation of a functioning smoke alarm. So I think that's an area we, we could improve on in South Carolina. And to this day, we still, most of the time, when we see a, an infant that dies in a sleep-related death, Almost always, there's some identifiable risk associated with that death. Either they were placed in the prone position, or there were blankets and pillows in the bed, or they were in bed with an adult, or unfortunately, often an adult and more children. And every year, we review deaths of multiple kids in a bed with a parent, and the babies found underneath one of the other children. I really think a child's less likely to wake up in that situation than an adult is. Also couches. We, we see a lot of parents who, you know, and many of us who are parents have been seeing ourselves doing it, you're falling asleep on the couch with a child on your chest, and many, of, many times they wake up and the child is in between their body and the back of the couch. So the couch, we see a lot of children. Um, it's just, a, you know, another unsafe sleeping environment that I agree, and I think sofas, um, excuse me, not sofas, but recliners are a very unsafe place. And, uh, you know, how many parents haven't held a baby on their chest while they're kind of reclining in their recliner and they wind up falling asleep and the baby does too? Very dangerous situation. Um, any questions? Yes. In 2009, I'm not aware. I, I think we're 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 not seeing an abrupt change in any of these trends, but we haven't reviewed all those. It's kind of hard to say about that. Anybody else have a comment? Um, so the trend of of SIDS de decrease in an accidental death is continuing. Um, overall child deaths have decreased some, not a huge amount. But uh, I'm not aware if there are any significant changes that will be in the 2012 report as compared to 2009. Uh, Laura, did you have anything else you want to say? Okay. Anybody have any questions of the, the authority here before I get up here? We want to especially thank uh, Dr. Smith for all his service on the uh, 
committee because he's just retired and we're going to miss him terribly because uh, he's been a faithful person to be there. And I compliment everybody that's on the committee because they give of their time and there's no money there uh, to help us. And I want to recognize some folks today from DHEC. Owens, if you and Jill would stand up. Owens Golf, Jill Barn. They have been a recent addition to the team uh, to do our annual reports. And we're so pleased with DHEC's commitment to us and from the governor's uh, direction. And I also want to compliment uh, Chief Keel from, from SLED of making this, uh, uh, the child fatality unit, a, a, um, one of his priorities. And I want to thank Patsy for being that person. Captain Lytle has been at this a long time. As a matter of fact, I, um, Patsy and I probably met in the early uh, 1980s when she was getting an award from the crime victims units from all over the state for her uh, work in uh, uh, designing our, our rape kits that have been emulated all over the United States for both kids and, and adults. She designed all of that. And we became uh, very good friends, and as a result of that, in 1992, we put our heads together to try to get a homicide by child abuse bill through uh, the General Assembly and was successful in doing that. Um, before that, they would, you know, ha we had the argument of not being able to prove murder because we lacked intent. You know, well, I didn't intend to kill the child that I flung up against the, you know, the wall. Uh, so we put some elements in the homicide by child abuse that made that easier to prosecute, and I give all that to you for helping write that. And then shortly thereafter, we decided we needed a, um, um, a child review. Um, the child fatality review, and in 1993, we approached uh, Senator uh, Isidore Lurie, who is now deceased, and his son Joel is carrying on a lot of that tradition to help us uh, put that um, put this whole committee together. So since that time, naturally, we're trying to look at child deaths and come up with things that need to be done and need to be changed. Um, Jennifer's already hit on a couple of things that she has taken back to her. Um, um, agency, and that's we encourage that with DSS, with with alcohol and drugs, that they go back and try to change any policies and and procedures that they may have locally and doing in their agency that would improve us being able to prevent uh, child deaths, and that's a very important part of that committee process. Um, you have some handouts in front of you. Uh, the one I'm going to hit on right now is the state child fatality public policy and, and legislative initiatives because we've had a number of things. Uh, this is not exhaustive, but we've had another, uh, a number of public policy changes and legislative initiatives that have come directly out of the work of the committee. Um, I mentioned the um, homicide by child abuse that really preceded the committee, but it was part of the, um, the planning. And along with that, uh, um, Section 16.395, which is the infliction of, and, and uh, 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 great bodily injury, we found that we needed you know, a stepping stone there and put that legislation in in 2000. Uh, the criminal sexual conduct with a minor, uh, 16.3, 6.55, most recently um, passed this past year. Uh, we went through and uh, kept the same penalties but redefined some of the uh, aggravating circumstances. In section 163740, the testing of certain convicted offenders um, for hepatitis and, and HIV came out of our committee. <coughs> the sexual battery of a student came out of our committee, and especially from, from Patsy and, and her involving me in that. She's always getting me into something. Um, the trafficking in persons just passed this year which has a significant section for young people and uh, sexual trafficking. <coughs> Can somebody get me some water? Yeah, there it is. <coughs> some of the current bills that are up, I don't know what's happening. <coughs> Um, mm, I'm losing my voice. How unusual there will be a parade. <laughs> <coughs> mm. There are a number of, of current bills 
that are being supported by the Joint uh, Children's Committee and our committee. This is not exhaustive, but you can read those um, by uh, uh, this we're not particularly supporting, but we are interested in this bill by Senator Bright on fire, uh, firearm marksmanship being in the schools. Don't know whether we need that or not. Um, one of the, the, uh, the Save Our Children Gun Lock Act is again an effort to try to get people to, to use um, procedures for locking guns and being more safe at home and trying to put liability there. <coughs> Probably the most important piece is the Jaden's Law. Um, we had a very terrible case, which I'm sure you're aware of since it was out of Pickens, um, of a young child that was um, had a sister. They were put into foster care. The sister was left in the foster care. The young man was allowed to go back to his uh, natural parents, and he was dead, I believe, within 48 hours of the return. Um, the grandmother um, has been prosecuted. It took me four years to get it prosecuted. I, I just, you know, Chinese water torture, which I'm well known for, you know, when are you going to do this, when are you going to do this, when are you going to do this, one? and finally got it prosecuted. <coughs> I'm sorry. Mm. I'll give Ms. Hudson a break just for a second. Um, I'll talk to you more, a little bit more, I guess, about how we investigate cases at SLED. SLED's been investigating child deaths since 1993. Um, the first year that we started up the unit, they told me that we probably would have around 40 child deaths to investigate. We investigate all deaths that are unexpected, unexplained, you know, they're um, suspicious in nature, uh, so we expected 40 cases. The first year we had 247. And those included, after we investigated them, natural, you, you saw the manners of death, natural accidental suicide, homicide, and undetermined. But to have 247 unexpected, unexplained child deaths was an awful lot, you know, to investigate. We had three investigators, obviously of three investigators, and then myself included, which made four, were investigating homicides. It was a real slow process because obviously a homicide investigation is very methodical and thorough in nature and it just takes a long time you know, to investigate. You certainly want to make sure you, you look at every aspect, every fact, and we're fact finders and that's what we were doing. So we kind of got behind and um, we're still behind. I would like to thank you know, Chief Keel for getting us four new agents this year. We're thankful for that. And, we're investigating more homicides or suspicious deaths, and, um, and, and that's helpful. But I'll tell you what I have found. I've been at SLED for 35 years. 15, the first 15 years were in forensics, and then the rest have been in investigations. But it has, um, I guess, astounded me at how people and why people kill kids. And it's still hard for the public and the community to realize that people will kill a child for different reasons. And some of the ones that we first had um, was the fact that, you know, this woman warned attention and killing a child would get, get them attention. And I'm sure y'all are familiar with Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And that's, it's not a mental illness, it's just a form, it's a fancy word for child abuse. And then um, there are those that the children are in the way. And so we had a child that had a special needs who had cerebral palsy. And uh, the mother had, you know, two additional children. Um, and she just felt like if she could get rid of the child that was special needs, she'd have a normal family so she didn't feed her special needs child. And if we had assumed that the child had died from the special needs issue or the disability, we would have missed that. And so these are long and methodical investigations. And, you know, with your help, I know every one of you that's in this room today cares about children. You know, when we do an investigation in a suspicious case, I'll tell you that we get on those suspicious cases the birth certificate and the death certificate and anything in between. So that involves birth records. You know, is there anything in the birth of that child that could have contributed to that death? We would need to know that. If so, that could have contributed. If not, the child's perfectly healthy at birth. What about the pediatric records? So we get the pediatric records and we look at those. We actually interview some pediatricians. We interview OBGYNs. It depends on the case. You know, are we clear what these charts say? If we're not clear, we go and talk to them. We go to the ER. We want to know to, from the ER person, you know, when they present, you know, 
interview those, the doctors, the nurses. Um, we get EMS records, we get the fire department records, the first responders, we want to know what they you know, said, um, what they observed, all that's important to us. And then we interview the caretakers, whether it's parents, grandparents, foster mother, or foster, you know, whomever, we want to talk to them. We want to know in the last 24 hours how the child responded and acted. Were they eating and laughing, or were they, you know, lethargic, you know, what was all that? So there's a lot that goes into our investigation, and, it, you know, children are so precious, but um, it's different reasons for killing children. We found that through our investigations. But I do want to thank you for everything that, you know, you do to help us investigate these cases and whatever agency you're from, thank you for being part of this team. The Department of Child Fatality and SLED is completely separate of this committee. Um, and we, we have to remain that way because we want to remain neutral and we have, all we do is give the facts to the committee and they try to determine why the children in the state of South Carolina are dying and is there a way to prevent it and reduce the number. And the numbers are coming down, that is a good thing. I'm happy to, to see that. I appreciate the committee's part on what they do. Um, we try to present 40 cases every other month and uh, we don't always meet the 40 cases, but I know that I have less than five minutes left. Ms. Hudson, would you like to say anything else? In your handouts, you'll see the legislation that we're interested in. I hope that you will be interested in those as well. And if you have an opportunity to talk to, talk to House and Senate members about that, I appreciate it. The other piece that you have is a recommend, the recommendations from the 2011, um, which is our latest uh, provisional report. That's not a final report, but you can see the recommendations that we've made in there. And they tend to be about you know, firearms, they tend to be about uh, fires, and you can read those for yourself. Sorry. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, does anybody have any questions, general questions, from any of the presenters today? Yeah. You know, SLED is an assisting agency, and so we assist as much as we're needed in some of the larger areas. They don't need us at all, and some of the smaller ones they do. So it depends on when we're called in. So if there is a shooting of a child, and you know, they may call us at the very beginning, we'll respond with crime scene, and we'll go in and interview the parents. If we find out through the investigation that it's an accidental, you know, because the, for whatever reason it was an accidental shooting, you know, we stop our investigation and the case is, is written up at that point, but we make sure. If it's like a drive-by shooting and the local law enforcement has identified the suspects, apprehended them, made an arrest, we don't get involved in that. We do get the information and we present it to the committee so that the committee can take actions on that. But as far as the investigation, we don't get thoroughly involved in that because the local law enforcement agency you know, did a very good investigation and they don't need SLES assistance. So it depends on what county it is and what resources they have and when we get called in. Sometimes we get called in before actually the child dies because the child is in PICU, pediatric intensive care, and not expected to live. So we'll go ahead and start gathering information and we hope the child doesn't, you know, die, but they want our assistance at the very beginning and then when they call Chief Hill and he says go, we go, and we go ahead and start the investigation. So it all depends. You know, every case is different, and we, are, we respond when we're called. And we hope that we can always add some expertise, you know, to a, a child death. It's very difficult, and I understand that, to investigate the death of a child, you know, under the age of one. Um, when they're small, you get a lot of emotions there, and it's hard to believe that anyone would ever harm a child. And I understand that. It's very difficult. Any more questions? I'm going to let Jennifer or um, 
Dr. Smith answer that because I know in the last meeting they asked for all of our statistics. Well, I guess I can answer this. In the last meeting <laughs> that we had, they asked for all the statistics of the charge, um, what they were sentenced to, and if we don't know, there's someone on the committee that's been designated to go back and find out what they were sentenced to, to determine the sentencing factor in the state. Is it going up? You know, what are people getting for killing children in the state of South Carolina? So I know that that is one initiative that they took on at the last meeting. Um, I, w I would make one comment about that, and we have actually listed this in our concerns in our annual reports. Sentencing is inconsistent. It, it kind of depends on which area of the state they're in sometimes, I guess because of the court system, but we feel like um, it's too inconsistent. Okay, thank you.